Matinee Manor was just a house in the same way that a blizzard was just a bit of snow falling on the ground. As a kid, my mom and I used to spend long holidays with Nana Georgina, and at the time, the many employees tasked with maintaining the house up to her impossibly high standards. Around my 12th birthday, mom and Nana had some sort of falling out and we never went to visit her again. It was bad for a long time, and it didn't help that I was far from an ideal son and gave her a lot of grief growing up. Things changed in high school once I developed an interest in art, painting specifically. We grew close once again and remained that way until five years ago when she was killed in a car crash. So when I received a call from a man claiming to be Nana's solicitor, informing me of her passing and that I was her only heir, I was beyond shocked. She left everything for me, not for my mom. By everything, he meant Matinee Manor, the land it was built on and everything else in it. I was going through the worst creative block of my entire career with the showing six months away, but still no paintings done. So. I packed all of my things, moved out of my studio apartment, and set out to Cold Springs, where Matinee Manor was located. My plan was to move into Nana's house for the rest of the year so I could focus on my paintings and not have to worry about menial things, like paying rent and utilities. Worst case scenario, Nana had loads of expensive decor items, an extremely rare Swarovski crystal collection, and hundreds of paintings and sculptures. Surely those things would amount to a lot of money. I was already planning on separating some items for an auction. She was quite known and well regarded in the art circles for her work back in the 80s and 90s, and there was nothing that rich, pretentious people love more than fawning over a dead icon, and spending money on it too. And the house was only three hours away from the city, so not that bad. On moving day, Nana's solicitor met me outside the gates to deliver the paperwork of ownership, the humongous set of keys for the property and a fancy looking file he called the property guide. I told him I wouldn't read it, because I'd been there many times throughout the years, so I knew the place well. He looked at me through his small rounded glasses and told me that Matinee Manor was a different place for the owner than it was for the visitors. Entering the manor again after so many years was shocking to say the least. Everything looked worlds away from the opulence and sophistication I remembered as a child. Gone were the bright colors, expensive chandeliers, and velvety fabrics adorning the many floor-to-ceiling windows. It was clear no one had taken proper care of it in a while, as the interior smelled like trapped mold and dust. Some of the faded wallpaper hid behind it dark, splotchy stains that looked suspiciously like black mold. I would have to get those checked sooner than later. My first day settling into the manor consisted of running up and down the many stairs, halls, and passageways opening doors and windows to air out the place and doing a major cleaning. I was completely exhausted by the end of the week and not nearly done with all the work. So much so that the guide laid forgotten on top of a desk for all that time before I decided to take a look at it. Old houses were finicky sometimes, with things like heating and electricity, so maybe there was something there I needed to know. The file read more like a storybook than anything else, detailing room after room of the house and how they needed to be cared for. Some could only be cleaned on certain days of the week or month, while others couldn't be cleaned or opened at all. There was also a blueprint of the manor, completed with the names of each room. One of them called my attention immediately, the mirror room. Because something I hadn't failed to notice throughout all our visits was the fact that there wasn't a single mirror in sight anywhere in the house. Mom used to bring a small hand mirror with her until Nana found out about it completely freaked out and confiscated the mirror. Thinking about it, that happened right around the time they had a big fight. Could that have been the reason? Would a simple mirror be enough to cause a wedge between mother and daughter? To my surprise, I found that one entire wing of the house seemed perfectly taken care of. I couldn't remember even being here before, so the experience of walking through the doors was entirely new and exciting. Heading to the mirror room, I instead discovered one that was covered in self-portraits of Nana, clearly painted throughout the decades that she lived in the house. I couldn't help but notice a clear and alarming progression in each of the paintings. She looked more and more disheveled, until the point that I could barely recognize the woman in the last one as my grandmother. Weird, but whatever, she was an old woman. Another one had dozens, maybe even hundreds of unfinished paintings depicting, 
I couldn't say for sure what they were about, only that they looked dark, both in color palettes and themes. Some looked like horrid portraits of people in pain and anguish. Some even seemed like depictions of murders and other atrocities. A far cry from Nana's usual expressionist and colorful work I'd grown used to. According to the guide, the last room of that wing was the infamous mirror room. I had barely entered this space when I was confronted by dozens of versions of me scattered across the walls from top to bottom. I didn't know what I was expecting from a space called mirror room, but still. Not satisfied by the fact that the room had mirrored walls and floors, there were also individual mirrors adorned by thick vintage frames hanging off the center columns. Staring at my reflection soon went from a fun novelty to a nauseating nuisance. The more I stared at myself, the more a weird vertigo clouded my brain. Standing somehow felt like being inside a merry-go-round. I would have tumbled into the ground if not for noticing a shadow passing behind me in one of the reflections, ultimately breaking the weird trance I seemed to have fallen into. My blood ran cold inside my veins. There was no one else inside the house with me. It had been just me since the solicitor gave me the keys. Hello? Mr. Petters, is that you? I called out, hoping he would answer back. Unsurprisingly, I was met with nothing but silence. Effectively creeped out, but trying to brush it aside, I instead opted to brighten the place up, using several of the mirrors in the rooms as decoration. Not even my own bathroom had a mirror, so it was definitely in need of one. That night, and several others after that, I dreamt of entering the mirror room and just staying there in the center of it, staring at my reflection. My mind, it seemed, couldn't think of anything else. To make matters worse, every time I walked around the house, I felt watched, like there was always someone standing right behind me, but I was never fast enough to catch them once I turned around. I also noticed the eerie feeling was stronger than the mirrors. On Matinee Manor, the days were dark and the nights even darker. It didn't take long before I fell into a weird routine of starting painting after painting, only to realize that I was doing portraits of myself. Every time, I couldn't understand why. I had my mind set on what I wanted to paint, but in the end, it was all the same, just portraits of me like I'd been staring at myself in the mirror while doing it. Suddenly, Nana's portrait room started making more sense. For some reason, she felt compelled to paint her reflection over and over again, and something told me the mirror room was to blame. One night, I found myself walking around the house to gather the mirrors and bring them back to the mirror room. I had never understood the expression, if you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss also gazes into you before, until now. As I stared at my tired eyes in the mirror, my pale face started to morph right in front of me. I wanted to close my eyes, but I couldn't. It was as if I didn't know how. No longer staring at my reflection, but now into the beautiful face of someone I'd never seen before. My mind was assaulted by violent flashes of that same face, battered and bruised, her eyes glossy and vacant like she had been left to rot alone. Then, I felt the weight of an invisible hand pressing down onto my head, pinning my small body against the unsteady ground. All the air left my chest as I gasped, desperately trying to break free from the vicious hold. My body was weightless, floating in absolute darkness as my lungs filled with muddy water and I sank down. Suddenly, every one of my reflections morphed into horrific visions of people in pain and suffering. I couldn't escape from their desperate pleas, not even when I closed my eyes. Their voices echoed in my ears, etching inside my brain, ringing incessantly to the point I couldn't make them out from my own thoughts. They all sounded like one. Somehow, I knew I was moving toward the same path as Nana. That same week, I did my first painting inspired by the things I'd been seeing. Except, inspired wasn't really the best word. It was more like compelled, like I couldn't paint something else, no matter how much I tried, just like with my portraits. Week after week, I continued painting my horrific dreams, visions, with a skill and style that I didn't have before. As if entranced, my hands guided the brush, stroke after stroke until another painting was completed. In three months, I had the equivalent of one year's worth of work, 
and what it felt like the same time in isolation. I couldn't remember the last time I got out of the house, let alone seen another living soul. Deep down, it felt like I couldn't leave, like the house or the things living within it wouldn't let me. My agent was pleasantly surprised by what she called my most inspired work yet, going on and on about the visceral nature of the pieces and how she'd never seen anything like that before. But I had. There was a room full of paintings just like them, all done by my grandma decades ago. I could practically see the cartoonish dollar signs taking the place of her eyes. There was a time that would have been everything I craved. Praise, money, and recognition. The starving artist trifecta. This place has been good to your creativity, Hugo, she said, smiling, still admiring the many pieces I'd shown her and carefully packing everything to go. But maybe it's time to get back home. You're spending too much time on your own. I thought about my dingy studio apartment in the city, about the friends and grievances I left behind about the busy, dirty streets and the endless noise of people crammed on top of one another. It all felt like a fever dream. Staring at one of the paintings, I said, I am home, Tasha. Matinee Manor had become my home, and I didn't plan on leaving anytime soon. Maybe ever. I moved into my first apartment straight out of college. I didn't have a lot of money saved up and my student loans were terrible, so the only place I could afford was in a pretty bad area just outside the city. Most of my friends wouldn't even come to visit me because it was in such a dangerous location. I could handle myself though. I was a big guy. I worked out. I settled into my new place really fast. The apartment was fully furnished and I didn't have a lot of stuff to unpack. I met all my neighbors, and they seemed pretty cool. There was one lady from the floor under me who was probably on stuff, but I just stayed away from her. Out of everybody, my favorite neighbor was definitely Claire, the woman next door. She was pretty, especially for a middle-aged woman, and she was always baking. Every day, I could smell cookies and cakes through my wall. It would have been annoying if I weren't able to taste them, but she always dropped off some of her treats at my doorstep, and they were delicious. My God. Claire really made me feel at home. Every time she saw me, she'd hand me some amazing pastry and ask me if I needed anything. She'd also compliment me on my good looks. It wasn't flirtatious, though. She never had any kids of her own, so I just assumed that she was treating me like a surrogate son. For my first few months at my apartment, I worked on my computer and pretty much stayed indoors, taking a nap every afternoon. I was too busy to drive into the city to see my friends, and they were too scared of my neighborhood to come to see me. So, most days, I stayed in front of my computer and worked. It was a little boring, but I always had Claire's amazing treats to snack on. It was like an endless supply of free delicious food. By June, my friend Robbie invited me to his birthday party at his favorite pub. I hadn't seen him or any of our other friends in months, so of course I said yes. I put on one of my nicer outfits, which seemed a bit tighter than I'd remembered, and rushed off to meet them. When Robbie saw me walk in, his eyes bugged out of his head. Dude, what happened to you? I had no idea what he was talking about. Why was he so shocked? He walked towards me and grabbed my stomach. You got really fat, dude. I looked down at my stomach seeing myself for the first time in a while. A fat gut was hanging out of my shirt. How would I not notice that? Just a few months ago, I was stocky but healthy. I didn't have a gut, especially one this big and droopy. Are you sick or something? Robert asked. You must have gained at least 50 pounds since I saw you. What happened? I told him about all the sweets Claire had given me, all the naps I'd taken. No wonder I was so out of shape. I've been overeating every single day and I barely got any exercise. I assured Robbie I was okay and he politely dropped the subject. But for the rest of the party, Robbie and everyone else at the pub couldn't stop staring at my stomach. After I said my goodbyes, I headed back to my car. An older woman ran up to me before I could get inside. Excuse me sir, are you Pigo 21? No, I'm sorry, I think you have the wrong person. She grabbed my hanging stomach and shook it. You can't fool me. 
I'd recognize you anywhere. You're Pigo. Extremely weirded out, I pushed her hands off me and jumped in my car. It was a really weird night. The next morning, Claire dropped a huge container of muffins at my door. I took them inside, but instead of eating them, I threw them all right in the trash. I really needed to get my weight back in check. The next time I saw Claire in person, I tell her to stop baking for me. About an hour later, I heard a knock on my door. When I answered it, no one was in the hallway, but another container of muffins was waiting on the floor. It had a little note on top saying, Don't throw these out. How did she know that I'd thrown out the first batch? Was she spying on me? A horrific feeling washed over me. Was Claire fattening me up on purpose? Was she filming me stuffing myself with her food? I raced to my computer. I typed in Pego21, the name that the old lady called me, and sure enough, I saw a link to a website with my face all over it. The whole thing was disgusting. There were hundreds of videos of me in this very room. Each video had names like Pigo Eats 8 Muffins or Pigo Naps After 3 Pancakes. I tried to click on one of the videos, but it was under a paywall. Still, it was probably best not to see how much of a glutton I'd become. I continued scrolling through the website. There was a tab called Diet Plan that kept track of all the food I was eating. And next to each day was a list of ingredients. As the plan continued, it looked like Claire had kept adding to her recipes. More butter, heavy cream, appetite stimulants, sleeping medication. I was horrified. Why was Claire doing this to me? And what sort of psychos would pay money to watch videos of me getting fat? I guess there were people into that stuff, but I never agreed to do any of this. I pulled out my phone, ready to report this to the police, where there was a loud knocking on my door. Open up, it's Claire! She shouted from the hallway. I know you found your videos. Open up and let me explain. I was not going to let her in. She was crazy. Go away, I shouted. My front door slowly creaked open. Claire must have had a spare key. That's how she was able to install all the hidden cameras, I guess. I opened up and saw that Claire wasn't alone. She had four other people with her. Three women and one man. They all looked excited to see me. I brought some of your biggest fans, Claire said. They're going to help me make sure that you don't stop making videos. Stop making videos? I asked. I never signed up for this. I don't want to be filmed. Claire nodded at her friends. They all ran toward me. I didn't have time to react before they grabbed me and tied my arms and legs to the couch. What are you doing? I screamed. They all smiled down at me, except Claire, who had left the room while I was being tied up. She came back wheeling a giant cart of muffins and brownies. They were going to force feed me. I tried to scream, but Claire shoved a brownie into my mouth. Claire and a rotating group of people took turns feeding me all day and night. Time became meaningless, so I wasn't sure how long I'd been tied up. It could have been a week, but it could have been a whole lot more. They no longer needed to keep the cameras hidden, so they positioned them all around me, filming every angle as I got fatter and fatter. One time, I heard Claire telling someone that this month's videos had made over $40,000. That's how much they were making from hurting me like this. They were never going to stop. They were just going to make me fatter and fatter until I died. Then one day, everything changed. Claire walked in, but she didn't bring any food with her. She patted me on my enormous belly and said, Well, it's been nice working with you, but it's time for me to go. Then, she untied my restraints. I was finally free. I tried to jump up and fight her, but I hadn't stood in ages and I was now too heavy to even sit up without a lot of effort. Just stay where you are, she said. I need to grab up my cameras and leave. You've been a great neighbor. Maybe I'll see you around sometime. I was trapped on the sofa, too weak to get up as Claire slowly walked around the apartment and gathered up all her cameras and equipment. Why are you finally letting me go? I asked. Because you're a little too fat now. No offense. And with that, she was gone. 
It took me hours to get off the couch and waddle toward the table where Claire had left my cell phone. I saw hundreds of missed calls, but I also saw a whole bunch of notifications from my bank. Apparently, Claire had deposited thousands of dollars into my account, giving me my portion of the website profits. You probably want to know how much weight I gained in all that time. Well, I'm too embarrassed to tell. But I'm slowly but surely trying to lose as much as I can. I'll never get back down to my normal size, and I'll probably always be hungry now. But at least I'm free and rich. As I walked into the lobby of the only hotel available on the other side of the road, a shiver ran down my spine. The interior of the hotel reminded me of my grandmother's old house with its faded wallpaper, creaky floorboards, and a musty smell that lingered in the air. I couldn't help but feel uneasy, but I had no other option than to stay the night as my car had broken down on the deserted road leading to the town. As I approached the reception, the receptionist gave me a welcoming smile, and I couldn't help but notice the wrinkles etched on her face. She handed me a pen and a book to fill out the necessary details, and I couldn't help but wonder how long it had been since anyone had written in it. After filling out the details, she handed me a rusty key and said, Room 315 on the third floor. Enjoy your stay. Her voice was calm and reassuring, but I could sense a hint of sadness in her eyes. I took the stairs to the third floor as the elevator was out of order. Each step echoed through the empty hallway, making me feel as if I was being watched. As I made my way to my room, I passed several other doors, which seemed to be creaking and moaning with each passing moment. When I finally arrived at my room, I took a deep breath before unlocking the door. As I stepped into the tiny room, I was met with a musty smell that filled my nostrils. It was so overpowering that I had to cover my nose to prevent myself from gagging. The room was dark and I could barely make out my surroundings. I turned on the light switch and took in the small bed, the desk, and the rickety wardrobe. Too tired to inspect, I fell on my bed and tried to sleep. But sleep eluded me because of a low hum or whisper. I tried to locate the source of the sound, but it seemed to be coming from all around me. It felt like the walls were vibrating, and I wondered if it was an earthquake or something worse. Suddenly, I heard a faint rustling sound, and I spun around to see if there was someone else in the room with me, but I was alone. I tried to calm myself down, thinking it, it must be my imagination playing tricks on me. However, as I looked around the room, I noticed that the noise was coming from the wall behind me. Curiosity got the better of me, and I walked toward the wall, trying to see if there was anything hidden inside. That's when I noticed a small hole in the wall. As I stared into the room, I felt a sudden gust of wind, even though the windows were closed. The room grew colder, and I shivered, feeling as if I was being watched. I moved away from the wardrobe, distracted by the wind, and searched for its origin. I saw that the door of my room was wide open. My mind raced in a million directions. I was sure that I'd shut the door earlier. I took steps toward the door and looked down the hallway, hoping to see something or someone that could explain what was happening. But the hallway was empty and drowning in silence. I went back into my room forgetting all about the hole in the wall, and went back to bed. As I lay there, the whispering continued, growing louder and more distinct. I knew that they were coming from the walls. The whispers made me remember what I wanted to forget, the hole. The whispers were joined by a soft tapping as if someone was trying to communicate with me from beyond the walls. I also wondered if the noise was coming from the people next door. I hoped it was. As the night wore on, the whispers grew more urgent. I contemplated stepping out of the room and reporting to the receptionist that the neighbors in the next room were making too much noise, but I also knew that doing so was pointless. 
I buried my head in the available duvet and cried for sleep to take me away. I longed to sleep and fall into the oblivion of the voices and whispers around me. I decided to check the hole again. With a trembling hand, I hesitated for a moment before stepping toward the hole. The urge to explore and see what was on the other side overpowered me, and I reached inside, trying to push the hole wider. Unfortunately, my hand couldn't fit, and I was left with no other choice but to bend down and peek through the small opening. To my shock, my eyes met another pair of eyes, which were staring back at me. For a moment, my heart raced with fear as I quickly looked away, hoping to see something else, anything else. But when I turned my gaze back to the hole, I was met with another pair of eyes. I felt as though I had stumbled upon something out of a horror movie. But when I looked around again, I realized that the room was filled with colorful parrots. The sight was surreal, and it made no sense that there were parrots in a room adjacent to mine. I knew I had to report this to the hotel receptionist immediately, so I stepped out of the room and made my way back to the front desk. I narrated my ordeal and what I had seen, hoping to find a solution. However, the receptionist looked at me with a stern expression and denied the possibility of parrots being in the hotel. We don't breed parrots, she said, her voice dripping with coldness. But there are parrots in the room next to mine, I retorted. No, sir, you must be mistaken, she replied, refusing to investigate any further. She explained that it was against the hotel's policy to check occupied rooms, leaving me feeling stranded and helpless. Despite my efforts to convince the receptionist, she remained adamant, leaving me with no choice but to return to my room. I lay in bed, tossing and turning as the parrots whispered and laughed incessantly, preventing me from getting any rest. The sounds were so disturbing that I even tried to scare them away by slamming the wardrobe door, but they continued with their noisy chatter. I couldn't help but wonder if the people in the room next to mine could hear the parrots too, or if they were completely oblivious. The thought of being alone in a hotel room with a group of loud parrots kept me awake all night, and I couldn't wait to check out of the hotel in the morning. When I woke up, it was morning, and I couldn't even tell the time that sleep carried me into oblivion. My head hurt, my knuckles hurt, and all I wanted to do was run. I packed my load and didn't take my bath or anything. I rushed back into my car after checking out and made a resolve to never check into an old hotel ever again. <laughs>